Welcome to Radio Baladi, the first Arab, Middle Eastern, and American simulcast radio show. Radio Baladi is broadcast every Friday morning on WNZK 690 AM from 8 until 9 Eastern Time on Good Morning Michigan with Layla Al Husseini. Our call in number 248. 248- Five five seven thirty three hundred, and now stay tuned for the best radio talk show on Arab and American issues with your host Layla Al Husseini. <laughs> Join me the first Friday of each month at eight a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East, live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNVK 690 AM and WDMV 700 AM. Good morning. Many Americans are not aware of exactly how the Israel lobby influences U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. And many Arabs are not aware that setting up a lobby in Washington is not an exclusive gift to Israel. That they can, too, have their lobby. So why don't they have one? A recent conference to discuss if the Israel lobby is good or bad for America was organized by the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs. With us today, two distinguished guests to talk about that and also talk about the presidential campaign as it relates to Israel. Delenda Hanley, News Editor and Executive Director, Washington Report on Middle East Affairs, and Janet McMahon, Managing Editor, Washington Report on Middle East Affairs. Our audience can also call in with comments or questions, and the number to call is 248-557-3300. That's 248-557-3300. My first question goes to both our distinguished guests, and uh, let's start with uh, Delinda. Um, what would you tell an average American who is not aware of the influence of the Israel lobby on U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East? Well, I would say that our conference gave a very good 101 or maybe 401 um, um, discussion of the Israel lobby. So I would first say go listen to the um, talks on um, at israelinfluence.org. Israelis, Israel's Influence.org, and um, we have all the videos up, we have the transcripts up, um, radio, I mean, you can listen or watch whenever you have time, all these speeches, and it shows the extent of the Israel lobby, and um, Janet actually is an expert on the Israel lobby, and I'm going to send it on to her. Yes, okay, go ahead, Janet. Yeah. Well, what I do um, is keep track of how much money pro-Israel PACs give to congressional candidates. So money is, I would say, a key element in the lobby's influence on U.S. foreign policy. I'm not, and one of our guest speakers, Kurt Beatty, uh, has written a book on the Israel lobby called How Congress Shapes Middle East Policy and How the American Israel Public Affairs Committee Shapes Congress. And he talked to hundreds of staff members, and all of them were acutely aware of APAC. They were uh, met as soon as they started working. There was an APAC representative there to talk to them and uh, 
and their influence is so extensive. It goes back to the communities, to selecting candidates, future candidates. So it's an extremely extensive network. It isn't just one organization. There's Jewish Community Relation Councils in every city and state, and they start the process, really. So it's, it's very uh, well organized. Um, Delenda, uh, I, uh, we, we referred to your uh, uh, conference uh, a minute ago, both uh, you and me, um, mm -hmm. but uh, t t tell us some more about the topics that were, uh, the diversity of topics that you dealt with. So um, you are absolutely right. We had such a diversity of topics. Um, we talked about the, Israel's influence on Congress and government agencies. And Grant Smith, our um, co-organizer who works with IRMIP, um, and, uh, he is a real expert on the lobby too. And he started off the conference describing the 10 ways the Israel lobby moves America. And he analyzed the history, size, scope, and activities of Israel affinity organizations. So not just lobbyists, but the charities that um, help build settlements, um, all the different things that you don't think of when you think of the Israel lobby. You think of a, an office in D.C. who sends out lobbyists to, um, to Congress, but there are so much more that make up the Israel lobby. And as um, Janet just said, uh, Professor Beatty talked about um, the... Uh, right, yeah. right. And, and, uh, uh, go ahead. And Dr. Madsen talked about how Israel stole um, U.S. weapons-grade uranium um, and to help build Dimona. And probably one of the audience's favorite speeches was um, Gideon Levy's. Um, he, he talked about what I would tell a visiting congressional delegation. And that kind of uh, was launched by um, a discussion last year. Um, one of a former congressman mentioned the trips um, APEC sends um, Congress people on. And he, he went on one, and he was astounded that they never, they tried never to have anyone speak to a Palestinian. So. Um, Gideon Levy, who is um, a Haaretz correspondent, told the um, assembly what he, what kind of talk he would, I mean, what kind of um, trip he would take congressmen on, and it was awesome. He, he Jan, do you want to talk more about that, or? Um, sure. Well, he said that he would take them to Hebron. He would take them to visit the families of Palestinians who were killed by Israelis. Things that. Congressmen never see on these organized trips, as Delinda said, that APAC takes congressmen on. And probably virtually every member of Congress has gone on one of these trips. And uh, he said he would also take them to the Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum there, because that is a kind of a founding myth, if you want. Not that the Holocaust is a myth, but the whole reason the raison d'etre for Israel is kind of based on that, which is not really accurate. And then he would take them to Tel Aviv, where Israelis, who are the 11th happiest people in the world, just live lives of modern luxury and go to cafes and everything and are completely oblivious to what's going on in the occupied territories. And they will be on the beach and see helicopters and warplanes on their way to bomb Gaza or something like that. So just that total disconnect of the general Jewish-Israeli public from what is going on an hour away from them is something he emphasized last year and this year as well. And, and he said uh, he never met an honest human being who had been to Hebron and didn't come back after a few hours in shock. So, so he, Hebron would be on his right. tour, as would Tel Aviv. Right. Uh, we uh, will be talking more about uh, the Israel lobby in a second, but here is another question for for both of you, um, uh, who is the presidential candidate uh, who is bound to come under the influence of the Israel lobby? Uh, um, Delenda, would you like to start? I think they are all under the influence of the Israel lobby. And we, we had quite a discussion about that at the conference because Justin Romando um, was claiming well, 
I, I'm also going to defer to Janet on this, too. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, Raimondo's okay. thesis was that Donald Trump is the only candidate who has said moderate things, like, I will be neutral in this, and I don't want to go to war over there. And so he's the only one who has expressed anything other than the party line on Israel. I would say all the other candidates are vying, as they demonstrated, and Trump did too at the recent APAC conference, that no one loves Israel more than they do, and they will do whatever Israel wants. So it's not very encouraging. Okay, uh, here is another explosive question. Uh, a lot of uh, of Arabs and and uh, otherwise, um, they say that Arabs have a lot of money. Uh, I mean, some of the Arabs, uh, a lot, really a lot of money. And the question is uh, is really twofold. First, where does the Israel lobby gather that enormous amount of money to fund their activities? And, and the, the, the second part of the question is, why can't the Arabs do the same with all the money, the oil money that they have, or at least they used to have? Well, I would say that there's, that American, the general American public identifies with Israel, which is not an accident. I mean, there has been a lot, there's, they're always in the paper, you'd think it was another state. And so that theme has been pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed. And we also had a showing of the film Valentino's Ghost, which shows how Arabs have been demonized in film over the years. And Philip Weiss of Mondo Weiss talked about the New York Times coverage of the conflict. And so Americans don't really understand, or they've been, let's say, encouraged to think of Arabs as the other or as terrorists or what have you. Whereas Israelis are always saying, oh, we have the same values, blah, blah, blah. So that's kind of a foundation. I think Americans need to be re-educated, and that's an important task. But apparently, the, it's really not the majority of the American Jewish community that funds APAC and these other organizations. There are just a few extremely wealthy people like Sheldon Adelson and Haim Saban. Adelson's a Republican, Saban's a Democrat just extremely wealthy, and they are providing the majority of funding of a lot of these organizations. Right. Um, uh, Janet, I can understand Israel's influence on Congress, um, but uh, is there uh, an influence on government agencies as well, and how? Absolutely. In fact, we had a few speakers talking about how government agencies don't enforce the law. The first, Delinda referred to Dr. Dr. Roger Matson, and he talked about how Israel stole uh, weapons-grade uranium and nothing was ever done about it. Then we had um, Susan Abu Hawa, the writer, the fabulous writer, and she's part of a lawsuit suing the Treasury Department for allowing so-called charitable organizations, American tax dollars, charitable organizations, to send money to illegal settlements in the West Bank. And so that lawsuit is saying, you know, this is our money. We have to make up the difference of all these tax-deductible contributions, and they're going to something that is contrary to U.S. policy. So that's a whole other battle, I think, is to get government agencies to enforce the law. I mean, the Justice Department has a place, a division that you have to register as a foreign agent, and they don't apply that. They tried, but they gave up to APAC and some other organizations. So... That's an important aspect. Um, uh, uh, Janet, let's be more specific, and if you would give us uh, some specific examples of some um, federal agencies that do come under the influence of the Israel lobby. Well, I, as I said, the Treasury Department, it has, um, it's in charge of the IRS, I guess, of tax-exempt organizations, so they're granting, they're saying this is a charitable organization, it's good for the U.S., it benefits society, so it's worth not making them pay taxes, and like Friends of the IDF would be one, that's Friends of the Israel Defense Forces. They send money to the IDF, and there are Friends of, uh, there's an organization, I can't remember the name in uh, in Hebrew, but it's it funds settlements in Jerusalem, and it's run by a doctor in Florida. So all these agencies, all these organizations have been granted tax-exempt status by the Treasury Department and the IRS, 
and this lawsuit is challenging the legitimacy of those exemptions. Stay with us. We'll be back in a second. The Dallas Pharmacy is a place to go for all of your prescription needs. All insurance plans are accepted at Nidal's Pharmacy. Prescription delivery is available. Nidal's Pharmacy is located at 23,800 Orchard Lake Road, Suite 102 in Farmington Hills. Call 248-477-2131. Nidal's Pharmacy, 248-477-2131. Jumana K. Roos. You've seen her images on giant billboards across the metro. Jumana K. Roos. You've seen her images on buses across the city. Now get to know Jumana K. Roos. It's sad, but it seems like we live in an age where most lawyers are focused on the bottom line, the money. And a lot of people have stopped wanting to truly advocate. I never forget this case. This woman chose me as a lawyer of last resort. She was hit by a semi truck. I was able to recover about $480,000. Not every lawyer is an advocate, but every lawyer should be an advocate. Let Jumana K. Roos protect your rights. Call the law offices of Jumana K. Roos at 1-866-YOUR-RIGHTS, extension 100, or visit yourrights.com. From their first words to first grade, Dreamy Children's Center will help get your child on the right track. The highly qualified staff works closely with parents to provide an experience that goes beyond early education. We can help nurture important personality traits with the use of educational programs ranging from preschooling for infants to Montessori-approved programs and bilingual curriculums for young children. All meals can be provided and we can arrange for after-school pickup. Dreamy Children's Center in Dearborn Heights on Warren, in Westland on Ann Arbor Trail, and in Troy on DeQuinder. Ziad brand. Quality products from our family to yours. Ziad Brothers Importing offers the finest quality products, including brands like Sultan, Kraft, Nestle, Hook, Rico Picon, Donna, and many more. Ask your retailer to carry these fine products because you deserve the very best. For more information, visit our website at www.ziad.com. That's www.ziad.com. Ziad. Quality products from our family to yours. I am Asif Abdel Jawad. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNVK 690 AM and WDMV 700 AM. Welcome back to our discussion on Radio Baladi. We are talking about the Israel lobby. Is it good or bad for America? With us are two distinguished, um, distinguished guests, uh, Delinda Hanley and Janet McMahon. And uh, my question, um, you tell me who would like to handle that question. Is it, it is often said that Israel promoted the invasion of Iraq in 03, 2003. How true is that? Well, that brings up the whole neoconservative component of American society. And um, as we know, they were in the Defense Department, Paul Wolfowitz, Douglas Spice. They had their own um, intelligence unit, let's say, and they were not um, rel they were trying to deflect the CIA from providing the intelligence, and they were providing their own, much of which as we or most of which, as we know, was completely inaccurate. And I, I always say, I refer back to this paper called "A Clean Break." which was written in 1996 when Netanyahu was an incoming prime minister. And it was written by Americans, Richard Pearl, and other neoconservatives. And the, I think the complete title was A Clean Break, A Plan for Securing the Realm. And the realm was not the U.S., the realm was Israel. And it called for destabilizing, for overthrowing governments in the region, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, it's just a plan to say, let's not deal with the peace, the 
Accord. Let's not deal with the Palestinians. Let's change the neighborhood we're in and change the basis that we relate to our neighbors and the Palestinians on. And uh, so I think that kind of set, the, that was a blueprint, really, for uh, future efforts on behalf of Israel. And I think the invasion of Iraq, as engineered by Wolfowitz and Cheney, et cetera, was a prime example of that blueprint being put in action. Right, but, but the, the decision to go to war was made by uh, the president of the U.S. So are you telling me here that the Israel lobby is capable of influencing the decisions taken by the president of the U.S.? Well, we certainly saw, it, it's, let's say, concerted efforts on that behalf with the Iran agreement, it, it didn't, uh, they didn't succeed in that, but it was quite blatant that they wanted to affect U.S. foreign policy. Netanyahu comes over and speaks to Congress to say, don't follow your president, don't follow his foreign policy, follow mine. So, you know, I, I do think they attempt to influence, and I think also the Bush administration got, the president in particular, got wrong information. And uh, there was right information out there, and he didn't get that. And so I think that's a big part of why we invaded Iraq. And apparently Wolfowitz, right after the 9-11 uh, attacks, said we have to go into Iraq when there was no evidence of a connection between Iraq and what had happened on 9-11. You raised a, a very uh, important question uh, right now when you said that the Iran deal... Um, in the Iran deal, um, uh, Israel or the Israeli lobby uh, did not succeed. And some people uh, may take that example to show that the Israel lobby is not as powerful as some uh, might think. Um, what do you think the reasons are for not succeeding in this instance? Well, I think, um, and Delinda, feel free to add to this, um, I think that President Obama drew the line, and he wanted that. That was his. That's his legacy, kind of. And so he didn't succumb to the pressure. But also, apparently, AIPAC was not happy that Netanyahu came over and spoke to Congress because it kind of polarized. It made the support of Israel kind of a Republican issue, and AIPAC wants it to be nonpartisan. They want it to appear that everybody in Congress, no matter what party, is a true supporter of Israel, and that's an extremely high priority. So the lobby, per se, wasn't necessarily happy with what happened, but I, I thought it was good because it, it became apparent to everybody who looked what was going on, and that's a major part of countering the influence of the lobby because they often just work behind the scenes and you don't know they're doing anything. And you don't see that um, a lot of American Jews, progressive American Jews, do not... Um, agree with what the Israel lobby is doing. And I think the latest attacks on Gaza um, and this concerted effort to um, destroy the Iran deal really brought American Jews out and out speaking out saying, this is not our, you know, this is not helping American Jews. And we, we hate what Israel is doing. We hate what the Israel lobby is doing. So suddenly there is a real um, in the American Jewish community, and all of that is is not good for the Israel or APAC. It, it's very important that there um, are these huge divides starting. But how uh, how tell us how powerful uh, is this element of the Jewish community that you are referring to? Janet, do you want to? Well, I'll just give my classic example, which is uh, Rand Paul, because what Israel, the APAC in particular, although APAC doesn't actually give the money to all these candidates, there's a, about 30 smaller organizations with names like San Franciscans for Good Government and Desert PAC. You'd never know they were Israel, Israel affinity organizations, as Grant describes them. But um, they really did not want Rand Paul to become a senator. And they gave a lot of money to his primary opponent. They gave a lot of money to his general election uh, opponent, the Democrat. And Paul won. And to me, that shows that if there's a candidate people want to vote for, 
the Israel lobby is not invincible, but they want to appear that they are, that you better not cross them or you're going to lose your next election or your opponent is going to win. But the problem, I think, is that it's hard to get a candidate that um, opposes what the Israel lobby does because they start so early on in identifying and grooming congressional candidates. I mean, Mark Kirk of Illinois is a great example. He got so much money when he was in the House. You could tell he was being groomed. He was getting Senate-level contributions, and sure enough, he ran for Senate and won, barely. Barely, though. So that's another example that, of their lack of invincibility. But they're very thorough, and they start very early, and that is a challenge. Would like to uh, remind our audience that they can call in with comments or questions. The number to call is 248-557-3300. That's 248-557-3300. Um, I have another question uh, for both of you. Uh, you can split it um, in between the two of you, um, Janet and, uh, and um, Delinda. Uh, to what extent does Israel have real influence on um, the mainstream media in the U.S.? Well, I think it's, it's, it has incredible influence. And Philip Weiss, as I mentioned, talked a lot about the New York Times and their bureau chiefs in Jerusalem and how they cover the news. Um, so that's just, it, it is, you just rarely hear the other side. And one thing that we were very happy about was that our conference was covered in the Washington Post, which has never happened before. We have never been covered in the Post. And in a way, it was like they had a story on APAC, which their conference took place two days after ours, and then they had one on our conference as well. So I think it's, you know, we're making inroads. We're getting the word out a bit. They'll, they'll use the word Israel lobby now where they never used to. But really, you just, you just, don't hear very much about Palestinian people who are killed or it's just, it's very unbalanced. And so thank goodness for online media like, like Mondo Weiss and Antiwar.com, Justin Raimondo's organization. And Americans can go elsewhere to get their information. I think that makes a huge difference. And of course, the Washington Report has been around since 1982. And I think we've really kept the conversation going. So it, it we have just always focused since day one on the Israel lobby as well as what's happening overseas and in Congress. And so we've just been there for more than 30 years really trying to get the word out. And C-SPAN also covered the conference, and we had calls from all over the country saying, well, we, we hadn't heard of, of, about the magazine. Can you send us a sample copy? And uh, we promised to do that because the transcripts from our talk, all the talks, are going to be in the next issue as well as um, a list of pro-Israel PAC contributions. So this will be very important for American voters to read this, this coming issue. And we can send it for free to everybody who asked, um, as it, or we encourage people to subscribe because we can't keep going without subscribers. And right, can, and, and this, this raises the question of whether or not you are getting enough funding like we know the Israel lobby uh, gets a lot of money uh, so to do your job uh, to counter the Israel lobby uh, are you in a comfortable financial position we, we are in a serious precarious position every year and um, putting on this conference really is um, serious serious money um, that goes out and if um, it jeopardizes the magazine in, in a way. We get uh, we got donations to um, help put on the conference, but each person's seat costs, I think we figured $300 to get yeah. all these um, wonderful speakers in um, to pay the hotel. The National and Press Club. Yeah, the National Press Club is a very expensive and beautiful venue. Um, so all, I would say, all Middle East-oriented um, organizations are struggling to survive. And, and I think um, Arab Americans don't realize how vital it is to support their, their local and, and national organizations. Um, everyone's working on a shoestring, um, shoestring budget, and it's very stressful, whereas the Jewish community 
it's it's like that they automatically give to their local and national organizations. They realize the value they get for their um, contributions. And we really, with your help, Dr. Joe, I would really like to educate Arab Americans. They need to do the same, or they were they will continue to be this very unfair um, uh, problem with the media, with our government, with the Israel lobby seeming to um, overpower American government. We um, we really we also have this bookstore. Um, uh, the Washington Report has Middle East books and more, and we sell all the best books on the Middle East, including that DVD of uh, Valentino's Ghost um, that we showed at the conference, and including Grant Smith's book, um, Big Israel, How Israel's Lobby Moves America. Anyway, a one-year subscription to our magazine only costs $29. Um, we really need people, more subscribers, because that brings more advertisers. We need um, more donations. We really need your listeners to help us. We'll be discussing what else, what more can Arab Americans do to help you when we come back from the break. Are you going to start a restaurant or grocery store soon? Do you need floor plans and designs? Call Naji Aboud at 734-744-9796. Do you want to buy kitchen and restaurant equipment at discount prices? Call Naji Aboud now, 734-744-9796. New concept products and design, the trademark of kitchen equipment. 5% discount on all purchases of $75,000 or more. New concept products and design, new location. 31185 Schoolcraft in Livonia. Learn more at www.newconceptproducts.com. Call Naji Aboud, 734-744-9796. Life for Relief and Development is a nonprofit charity that has been providing humanitarian aid and development to people and communities regardless of race, color, religion or cultural background for over 22 years. When disaster occurs here or around the world, LIFE rushes to provide food, medical aid, and shelter to those in need. LIFE also has development projects that provide medical relief, water purification, educational programs, relief for orphans, and much more. Your help and support can greatly improve these efforts. All donations are tax deductible. For more information, please visit our website at lifeusa.org or call 248 424-7493. That's lifeusa.org, 248-424-7493. When you're looking for the best in optical care, Dr. Imad Nakash is your doctor to see. With years of experience and thousands of successful procedures performed, you can trust your eyes to Dr. Imad Nakash. See Dr. Imad Nakash and his professional staff for your eye care needs. There's two locations to serve you. In Hazel Park, call 248-336-3937. 248-336-3937. In Rochester Hills, call 248-299-3937. That's 248-299-3937. Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time. I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNZK 690 AM and WDMV 700 AM. Welcome back to our discussion on Radio Baladi. We're talking about the Israel lobby. Is it good or bad for America? Uh, with us today, um, Delinda Hanley and Janet McMahon. And we were discussing uh, the reasons why the Arab American community is sort of delinquent in supporting your efforts and their causes. So I want to know 
the reason behind that delinquency. Talenda? Well, um, I must say we also we have a lot of Arab American donors too. Um, a lot. We have an angels list at the end of each issue, and you'll see, you know, half the names are Arab American names. Um, so I'm I'm just saying that it it takes a lot of people to put out a publication, and um, the Israel uh, affinity groups are willing to donate a lot more money um, to media and um, you know than than Arab American community and and this I, I don't know how your radio station does but um, I think Arab Americans are so used to giving to charity it's part of the culture or um, educating their their family get, getting the best degrees for their family members um, you look after your family you um, take care of people's health needs overseas and where you know you originated from perhaps um, charity is important to Arab Americans but you don't realize maybe that um, media especially free media <laughs> online media uh, and um, paper media need support too um, you you, um, you hear on national public radio every couple of weeks it seems like they are asking for contributions it, this, it takes money to um, to break through this this press uh, issue that we have I'm sure Janet you have something to add to well Go ahead, would, Janet yeah I would just say it's not only an Arab American issue either I mean it affects all Americans and Arab Americans are Americans so I think that's one thing we're trying to do with this conference is to explain to people it isn't just about what's happening over there. It's happening, it's our money, it's our tax dollars. For example, Israel is trying to get an increase in the annual military aid from $3.5 billion a year to $5 billion a year. And apparently they were offered $4 billion a year, and they said, no, we want five. So President Obama wants to have this new initiative on cancer. Are we going to fund that new initiative, or are we going to give a foreign country an additional $1.5 billion a year? So, you know, I think Arab Americans understand the situation, and Amer other Americans maybe need to be educated more. But it's in everybody's interest in this country, in my opinion, to fund what needs to be done here instead of giving military aid to a foreign country, at, to an, an incredible amount of aid. So we need that money here. And uh, Rula Jabril um, spoke at our conference, and she also encouraged people to help um, online media and, and the Washington Report. Um, and she said we all need to stick together more um, because it, it is hurting America, the country we all care about, too. And, and one question is uh, whether or not the time factor is critical here. I know that um, the Jewish community uh, came to this country after World War II and they did not have any such influence as they have now. And uh, on the other hand, you have the Arab community who are recent in this country and perhaps we are talking about a potential improvement uh, for the Arab uh, American community uh, as they produce uh, the second and third generations. Is that, is that right? I, well, I, I would... Go ahead. Janet, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think maybe timing does play a role because I'm sure there was anti-Semitism here when Jewish people started immigrating here. But there's also was anti-Irish and anti uh German and everything else. So by now, the J American Jewish community has assimilated and has really been incredibly successful, whereas the Arab American community, they come from many different countries, and they've been demonized, um, as we heard at our conference. So their, their obstacles, I think, are much greater at this point in history, and the Jewish American community is kind of settled in. But as a more and more Arab Americans enter the um, media industry and, and start making films um, and working side-by-side side in newsrooms with 
other um, journalists or lawyers, more Arab-American lawyers. Boy, we heard some wonderful lawyers at our conference. As, as the, and the students who are really active on campus and the professors, as more uh, Arab-Americans enter these fields and rise to the top, they're going to take care of this problem. So education is vital. Maybe our magazine educates um, Joe Blow out there, the American who's been here all his life and and that doesn't really have a clue about U.S. foreign policy. Arab Americans know these problems. The, uh, your neighbors next door don't. So we try to educate Americans who are clueless about U.S. foreign policy, or their own country for that matter. Uh, we have uh, a caller on the line. Uh, we have Jerry uh, on hold. Uh, go ahead, Jerry. Uh, introduce yourself. Thank and you. Go ahead. Thank you, Doc, Dr. Atif Abdel-Jawad. Good morning to you and to your distinguished guest. Uh, Dr. Atif Abdel-Jawad, uh, my question to your guest is, do you think uh, the lack of Arab American not going uh, to the election uh, 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 polls, is that one of the reasons that the... Uh, the American uh, politician, uh, they do not see any encouragement uh, to uh, defend the right of the Arab uh, people, especially um, the Israeli-Arab uh, uh, conflict. When you see the majority of uh, um, uh, Jewish American, especially when you said earlier, after World War II, the Jewish community uh, built the base over here in, in this uh, American society. So do you, do you think we could blame the American Arab themselves for that? And thank you, and I'll listen to, to you on the radio. Thank you, Jerry. Uh, who would like to handle that question? May I Linda's start? very knowledgeable about this. Well, yes. Okay, um, I'm going to start and say that... Um, I think Arab Americans do, and Muslim Americans, and Christian Arab Americans, everyone votes a lot. I mean, I think their the percentage of voters is higher than for you know Americans who have been here all their lives. Um, the The problem is, and, and I've been to care offices as they called people before the election, saying, "Come out, register to vote." And Arab um, American Institute does this too. They really um, make sure uh, Arab Americans are voting, and and they do. I think the problem is exit polls ask as you know people are leaving after voting. You know, are you Jewish? Are you? Uh, they they ask the wrong questions. They don't find out that these Arab Americans or Muslim Americans are voting. They don't mention what percentage voted in the newspaper articles. There's there's we need to do better saying um, the Arab Americans are supporting this candidate or um, that they have voted in mass um, just to show politicians that they better listen to their um, concerns. And yeah. they do have uh, candidate forums, don't they, yeah. too? Yes. I yeah. mean, they're very well informed, I think. In, in Virginia, um, yeah. they had a wonderful, they always have a candidate forum and I tell you, there are more candidates coming to speak to Arab Americans than the audience. That everyone wants to get every ethnic, um, you know, support they can, um, and it's very important to have these candidates forums and and to ask the hard questions and to get these candidates thinking, because really that is a wonderful way to change. And and of course, to run for office too, you can start at the school board level. It's so vital to have Arab American candidates too. Uh, some people say that one problem is that uh, Arab American candidates or, or even voters, uh, they are transfixed with um, the Arab Israeli uh, dispute and they are not exactly focused on problems that concern the daily life of the average American citizen. I think you might be right, and sometimes I feel like I'm the same way. <laughs> I'm looking at everyone through that prism. But, um, of 
course, when you're involved in your local community and see poverty and homelessness and health care problems or prison um, issues, those are all things that unite Arab Americans with other Americans when they're concerned with their local problems. And, and so it's important to be involved fixing our local problems, too. And, and I see um, Muslim Americans in, in Maryland, um, for instance, so involved in their, with providing health care. Doctors volunteer their time at clinics and, and mosques. And it's, it's, um, you can see it working in the local level. We just don't see it maybe on the national level. We'll be back after the break. أسواق زمزم الواقع على 24065 أورشد لك في مدينة باركمنستون هاوس ترحب بالجالية العربية والكلدانية تنزلة كبيرة على عموم المواد الغذائية في يوم الأربعاء من كل أسبوع لا تنسوا فريش كاري أوت جميع أنواع المعجنات وأيضا صواني الكنب المشكلة والصمون الحار لحوم حلال الجالية العربية والإسلامية الملحمة بإدارة قصاب الجالية المعروف سلوان جربوع زروهم على 24065 أرشد لك في مدينة فارمكتون هاوس أو اتصلوا بهم على 2487306300 أسواق زمزم للمذاق عنوان لجميع طلباتكم اتصلوا على 2487306300 أسواق زمزم للمعاملة الراقية وكرم أضيافة عنوان أنا تي ترافل للسياحة والسفر بإدارة نبيل الباشا تعلن عن افتتاح مكتبها الواقع على 28695 راين رود في مدينة وورن خدمات متميزة وخبرة تفوق العشرون عاما نضعها في خدمة عملائنا الكرام مع أمتي ترافل يمكنكم حجز رحلاتكم الجوية داخل أمريكا الوطن العربي وأنحاء العالم إضافة إلى الأماكن السياحية والاستجمام للحصول على أفضل العروض وأنسب الأسعار ولمزيد من المعلومات اتصلوا على الرقم 5865789126 قشات ميديترينيان ماركت بإدارة سهر قشات وأولاده يرحبون بالجالية العربية والكلدانية جميع أنواع المواد الغذائية البان طازجة الكرازات والبهارات الطازجة داخل الأسواق مطعم ميديترينيان شيش كباب يقدم يوميا جميع أنواع الكباب المقبلات العربية العراقية وثواني الكامبو المميزة تفتح الأسواق من الثامنة إلى التاسعة مساء من الاثنين وحتى السبت ومن الثامنة صباحا إلى التاسعة مساء يوم الأحد تقع الأسواق على 3239 نورث وسترن هايوي في مدينة فارمينغتون هيلز لحم حلال للجالية الإسلامية لطلباتكم من المطعم كول 2485387855 ذا رس 2485387855 قشة ميديترينيان ماركت خدمة متميزة ومعاملة راقية عبد الجواد Join me the first Friday of each month at 8 a.m. Eastern Time I will be discussing some of the most important issues and events in the Middle East live on America's Voice of the Arabs. WNVK, 690 AM and WDMV, 700 AM. Welcome back to our discussion on Radio Baladi. We're talking about the Israel lobby. Is it good or bad for America? And with us uh, are two distinguished guests, uh, Delinda Handley and Janet McMahon. And I would like again to remind our audience uh, they can call up uh, with qu questions or comments. And the number to call is 248-557. 3300, that's 248-557-3300. Many in the Middle East think that having an effective lobby 
is an exclusive gift to supporters of Israel. But the fact, uh, as we all know here, is that anybody can set up their, their own lobby. Um, can you tell those guys in the Middle East how a lobby is set up in the U.S.? Um, Janet, perhaps? Well, I am under the impression that there's one particular individual whose name I can't remember who really set up this structure where, and it's, it's not the same as the NRA, for example, because you have APAC, which is not a lot, well, it is a lobby, but it is not um, a PAC, it's, but even you think it is, but it is not a political action committee. So the IRS classifies it as a membership organization. And so because it's not a political organization, it doesn't have to report its funding or its expenditures. So really, the Americans are deprived of a lot of information about APAC. And then there are all these other little, as I mentioned before, PACs, real true PACs that give money. They all give to the same people just about. So it's very clear that there, it, this is being coordinated somewhere because it's not random at all. And in fact, there's a PAC in Maryland that didn't give to any candidates from Maryland. They gave to candidates elsewhere in the country, in Nevada and anywhere else but Maryland. So it's a kind of unique setup, this one. And I believe that the same person who came up with this structure kind of set up also the Cuban lobby. So this is not a typical lobby. But really, you know, you have to register, you have to report, but you are free. The NRA is free to lobby. It's, it's considered a legitimate part of American political life. So are there Arab American lobbies? Yeah, there were. I'm not sure. There was the National Association of Arab Americans, I think, was a lobby similar to um, to the NRA, let's say, but obviously much smaller. But I'm not sure how active they are anymore. So how so, easy would it be to do right. create a lobby? Um, you know, I mean, I guess, that would take some research and everything, but it's not its not against the law, you know, so it can be done, you know, and it has been done, and there are people in the Arab American community who have done it, so I think there's a lot of resources out there. Right, so I guess the, the main points here is uh, are that, one, it's legal, it's lawful, uh, number two, you need funding, enough funding, uh, number three, you need to register and report your activities and uh, your funding um, to maybe the Justice Department or to Congress. And finally, I guess you need to have uh, excellent organi organizational skills. Would right. that and be members. fair? <laughs> People who will support you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay. Now, um, what uh, is... An, uh, now, let me go back to an explos uh, explosive issue, and I'm not afraid of self-criticism here. Uh, do you think um, the so-called Islamic extremism uh, or terrorism, um, does it make it more difficult for the public, the American public, to get the message that, that needs to be propagated to them, to the public? I would say absolutely. What about you, Delinda? Well, um, after let me just say, before 9-11, um, candidates were vying for the Arab American and Muslim American vote. They were, they were seeking it and um, agreeing to say certain things and, or have campaign promises uh, about secret evidence and this and that. And then 9-11 happened, and all that progress was out the window. And so uh, definitely any terrorist actions... Um, destroy, or, or temporarily at least, I think it's starting to um, recover the Arab American and Muslim American um, votes matter again. But um, any bit of progress, that, uh, and, and there was a lot of progress right before 9-11. In fact, that's why so many conspiracy-minded conspiracy people think that um, it was not Arabs who did it because it destroyed what was happening that was good for Arab Americans in this country. So definitely, uh, Americans only see one thing on TV, the, the uh, terrorist problems, all this stuff, and they don't see 
what their Muslim neighbors right next door um, are, are doing for their, our country, all of our country. And I think uh, uh, American, yeah, go ahead. average American is afraid now. Uh, and before 9-11, I don't think that was so much the case. And I think after 9-11, Muslim Americans were afraid to really organize and speak out. So it really had a devastating effect on the entire country. Uh, are you surprised that uh, after Mr. Trump uh, called for banning uh, Muslim travelers coming into the U.S., and yet uh, there has been no adequate protest uh, Muslims, and I'm talking here not just about Arabs, but Muslims include uh, Pakistanis and, and other nationalities, and uh, there are so many of them in the country. They have not even taken to the streets to protest uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Trump. Are you surprised? I think um, different um, national organizations have, you know, put out press release. That they've had um, press conferences. We just don't hear about them in our um, national news, on our network news, on our. They don't get coverage in our newspapers. What would you say, Janet? Well, I know I've seen a an online campaign, and I'm totally illiterate about this, but it's it's called something like hashtag My Muslim Neighborhood where Muslim Americans are saying, well, I live in Brooklyn, you know, and this is what it's like here, and this is what my neighbors do and everything. So I think you're right, Delinda, the mainstream media do not report this, but I do think there's a lot of activity online, maybe among younger people. And so that's, and, and it's a very clever and very effective campaign. And so maybe it's more effective than taking to the streets. I don't know. But of course, it's something that you know, it's just objectionable. It should be objected to in every way possible. And do you think, Mr. Trump, if uh, if he won uh, the presidential election, do you think he, being in the Oval Office, would implement a lot of of his rhetorics uh, that we hear uh, in the campaign? Well, according to Justin Raimondo, who spoke at our conference, um, what he is proposing on these levels is not to quote Justin, it's, it ain't going to happen. <laughs> so he feels that this is the, it's really foreign policy that is the president and the White House's purview, whereas a lot of these other policies are, are congressional. So he, I think, feels it was just rhetoric on, on Trump's part. And I think Trump, you know, he just says whatever he thinks will go over wherever he is. So, I mean, it's, it's still objectionable, but I'm not sure how much he would actually imp could implement it. I have uh, one uh, minute uh, left, and uh, so my last question uh, would be, what is needed now to get the message across to the American public that the Israel lobby runs counter to U.S. interests? Well, that's what we're trying to do with our conference, and to publicize it and get people to watch the videos and... Uh, as we say, I mean, it's always been compared to a night flower that flourishes in darkness, and it, the light of day is anathema to it. And so we're trying to bring the light of day to it. But it's an uphill struggle, but we're, I think we're making progress. Thank so may you I, I'd like much. to re uh, Yeah, go ahead. May go I, ahead. I'm going to repeat um, that website so people can watch themselves. It's www.israelsinfluence.org. And our magazine's website is www.wrmea.org. And go there, and we're trying to unite this our community, all of our communities, and educate Americans who have no clue. Thank you very much. We have been discussing the Israel lobby. Is it good or bad for America? Uh, we would like to thank our two distinguished guests, uh, Delinda Hanley, News Editor and Executive Director, The Washington Report on Middle East Affairs, and Janet McMahon, Managing Editor, The Washington Report on the Middle East Affairs. And we'll see you again the first Friday of next month. Goodbye.